During 1971, the United States attempted to hand over primary responsibility for offensive action in South Vietnam to local forces. They found the going tough. Lieutenant William Kelly was found guilty at a court-martial of killing Vietnamese civilians at My Lai. Anxious to forget Vietnam, President Nixon welcomed Japan's Emperor Hirohito to the United States. On his first trip away from his homeland, the Emperor went on to Britain. While in France, Mick Jagger seemed confused by the press at his wedding to Bianca. On the 7th of December, the literary world of Manhattan was astonished by the news that reclusive billionaire Howard Hughes had agreed to tell his life story to an obscure writer named Clifford Irving, previously best known for a book called Fake. Less than a month later, there was even more surprise as the legendary aviator, producer and entrepreneur protested via a sound-only press conference that the proposal was a hoax. But at Irving's house on Ibiza, he assured reporters that the billionaire had met him many times and the voice at the press conference was not that of Howard Hughes. Basically, it was his money and he could do what he wanted with it. I met Howard Hughes, he talked to me, he gave me the material and I have it. Do you believe the book will still be published? Oh, that's a big question. Uh, I believe it'll be a crime if it's not published. Because it is the autobiography of Howard Hughes. And as far as I know, he wants it published. The book was ready to go and sure to be a massive bestseller if it truly revealed the mind of one of the most extraordinary men of the century, who had suddenly disappeared from sight after a life of adventure. At 18, he inherited the $10 million Hughes Tool Company, an oil drilling business with exclusive patents. He ran it himself and at 21 moved to Hollywood, divorcing Ella Rice, the girl he had married when he was 19. Soon a successful producer, he dated the stars, including Ginger Rogers, English actress Ida Lupino, whom he helped to become one of the few female directors. Ava Gardner, who, during a row, hit him over the head with a bronze statue. Jean Peters, his second wife, whom he tried and failed to make into a major star. And Jane Russell, for whom he designed a special bra when she acted in his most successful movie, The Outlaw, which he directed himself. But his first love was aviation and breaking records. In 1934, he flew across America in a record nine and a half hours. He twice broke the world air speed record, reaching 352 miles per hour in 1935 and bettering that in a specially converted mail plane in 1937. A year later, in 1938, he set his sights on the round the world record of seven days, 18 hours, achieved by Wiley Post five years before. His twin engine Lockheed landed at Brooklyn on the 14th of July. He and his three-man crew had shattered the world record by taking only three days, 19 hours and 17 minutes. They travelled via Paris, Moscow, Omsk, Yakutsk in Siberia, Alaska and Minneapolis. A crowd of more than 30,000 people had gathered to greet them and Hughes and his crew were mobbed as they emerged from their aircraft. Everyone was delighted by the modesty of their new hero. All I can say is that this crowd is trying to be more Handling out for the last three days. Then came the official welcome and a ticker tape parade down Fifth Avenue and Wall Street, only slightly marred by the injury of two women hit by a motorcycle outrider who had been struck by a heavy roll of unfurled tape. New Yorkers threw 1,800 tons of paper, some 200 more than on Lindbergh. Honored with a Congressional Medal, Hughes paid tribute to his fellow pilots. Any one of the airline pilots of this nation with any of the trained Army or Navy navigators and competent radio engineer in any one of our modern passenger transports could have done the same thing. But not all his flying was as successful. 
He was his own test pilot, crashing four times, and was once written off for dead, emerging with a crushed chest, nine broken ribs and a lacerated skull. He was so badly scarred that he grew and kept a moustache to hide the burns. When the Second World War broke out, he started Hughes Aircraft, with the aim of once more becoming a pioneer, this time with advanced flying machines. His most ambitious project was a giant flying boat, more than twice the size of any other plane of its day, and more than the third larger than today's 747 jumbo jet. Because of wartime shortage of metals, he built it of wood. Hughes called it the Hercules H4, but his detractors had other, crueler names for it. Some called it the Flying Lumber Yard, others the Flying Coffin. But the name that stuck was the Spruce Goose. The big question was, would it fly? It was 1947, and the war was over before that question was answered. Hughes said he would prove it could. But few others thought it could ever lift off. As the Spruce Goose moved forward, the thousands of spectators held their breath. It seemed stuck to the surface, then it appeared to be straining upward. It was fly. After one mile, the spruce goose hit the water again, and that was the end of its flying career. The monster was put into mothballs in a hangar at Long Beach, California, where, as the largest aircraft ever built, it became a tourist attraction. Hughes was called before a congressional committee to explain why the spruce goose had cost US taxpayers $18 million for a white elephant. But he shrugged it off, as he did another committee hearing the same year about his airline Transworld Airways and the battle with its rival, Pan American. TWA was a triumph for Hughes. He had built it up from nothing and made it into one of the largest airlines in the world and a symbol of American strength and technical prowess pioneering some of the most modern airliners of the day, such as the Lockheed Constellation. In front of the Senate, he revealed some of the pressures he had been put under to amalgamate with Pan Am. During that luncheon, the Senator, in so many words, told me that if uh, I would agree to uh, merge TWA with Pan American Airways and go along on his community airline bill, that there would be no further hearing in this matter. In 1966, he sold TWA at a profit of $500 million. But by then, he had already been a recluse for many years, having disappeared into self-imposed perder in the desert in the early 1950s. He added to the mystery surrounding him by buying up $100 million worth of real estate in Las Vegas and investing $300 million in its gambling industry. As peripatetic as he was secretive, he was spotted all over the world, in London, at the Inn on the Park in Park Lane. Then in the Bahamas, first hidden in another top floor hideaway at the Hotel Xanadu in Nassau. And then settling for a while at another Bahamas hotel, the Britannia Beach. Hughes ran his vast empire by remote control through a trusted accountant named Noah Dietrich. He worked closely with Hughes for 32 years until they suddenly fell out. Then Dietrich decided to use the scribbled notes with which Hughes communicated his wishes to his executives as the basis of his own autobiography. Growing ever more eccentric, Howard Hughes, now believed to be the richest man in America, hid his face completely when moving in and out of hotels. The only people who ever saw it were his five Mormon bodyguards. His bizarre lifestyle made him easy pickings for conmen who offered false photographs, interviews and memoirs. He could afford to pay for his privacy. Did you see the fellow that brought out through the lobby? You mean the one? Yeah. Well, that, uh, that was the invisible man. We were told that uh, you didn't have Howard Hughes up there, and uh, who was that fellow up there in your presidential suite? We don't tell anything about that information. Howard Hughes is out here. That isn't Howard Hughes? No. Well, who is that? That we don't give out. So it was not surprising that many people suspected another scam when they saw the headlines. 
But McGraw-Hill could argue that Clifford Irving was a known author who had arrived with letters from Howard Hughes confirming that he would collaborate in the production of the autobiography. Irving produced further letters from Hughes, urging publication and expressing surprise at any delays. He claimed to have had more than a hundred meetings with the recluse, and it was not surprising that McGraw-Hill executives, led by publisher Albert Leventhal, grew increasingly excited by the prospect of a massive coup. They had few doubts about signing a contract with Irving and Hughes, and accepting instructions, apparently from Hughes, to send cheques to Clifford Irving for sums which eventually totaled more than $600,000. Irving himself received an initial $25,000 advance, and the remaining money was paid in cheques made out to H.R. Hughes. These were soon cashed. 